clapping and I haven't even said anything yet. Uh, that's, a, that's a good sign and you're real gullible, I don't know which. I'd like to thank Helen and the, public, the Kingsport Public Library for hosting this exhibition and inviting us to come up here today. Uh, when she talked to us last August, I guess it was or so, we came up and looked at the setup and got really excited about things. And as time has gone on, I've been more and more excited about this. Also, I'd like to thank the Smithsonian for, for providing the uh, displays out there. I have nothing to do with those displays personally, but I did wander around and look at them beforehand, and they're pretty impressive. So that's why I said I'd, I'd be out there for a little bit after the question and answer session in here, just to, if you have any questions about them, I can talk to the limit of my knowledge about some of the stuff that I see out there. So I think that'll be exciting for some of you. And I'd also like to thank this nice lady right here for loaning me a pen, because I forgot <laughs> to bring one. So, and... And I gave it back. It, it was pink, and I didn't want to keep it. It's, that might end up on YouTube as well. That's, it's not my style. So, um, A little bit more about me uh, just before we get started. You can probably already tell I, I talk fast. I don't talk like I'm from around here, even though my great-great-grandparents were from East Tennessee, Murphy, North Carolina, and Tazewell, Virginia. And I found that out after moving here and doing some family history work, and I was really pleasantly surprised because we love this area. And so I don't know how I ended up with a Chicago accent because I've never been there in my life. But I grew up out west after the Civil War and the railroads were being extended out west. Well, to you, they were out that way. <laughs> uh, my ancestors moved out there and worked for the railroads, and that's how we ended up being from Colorado. But again, people in Colorado don't talk like me either, so... <laughs> They always ask me where I'm from. Anyway, I'm going to move fast. What I'd like to do today is not just lecture to you. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll try to get to you as soon as I can. Um, afterwards, we will have time for some questions and answers. And so hopefully we'll get all your questions answered. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know. Okay? I'd rather do that than make something up, because one of you might in here actually know the answer, and then I would look really silly. Or you might go home and do a search on the internet and find out the answer, and then I could get fired. Who knows? Probably not, but still. My name is Brian Boyd. I work for the National Weather Service in Morristown. I'm actually a meteorologist by degree and a hydrologist by decree, which means I got my degree in meteorology. I worked as a meteorologist for years, and when I came to Morristown's office, I came in as the office's hydrologist and I became responsible for the office flood warning program which we've had recently a lot of, and also for training the staff to recognize potential flooding and how to keep up on flood, flood warnings and things like this. So I sort of the flood manager. I have nothing to do with how much it rains or where it rains. Don't ask that question, okay? Um, this image right here, I promised I'd give a little plug to a friend of mine who I work with in an international organization called Project Atmosphere Australia, and it's online, PAA. If you do a search for that, you'll find it. It's a really outstanding organization that teaches students at all levels about weather. And it's comprised of, it, it was based in Australia, but it moved out over the entire earth, and it comprises a, a lot of people who are in, in the profession or just wannabes who really enjoy it, act as subject matter experts and contacts, and a lot of teachers are involved. We answer questions for the kids and a lot of stuff. This, photo was taken in uh, Ackworth, uh, England, at the Ackworth School. Ackworth is the home of the man who first started naming with the modern nomenclature of clouds. There are 140 different kinds of cloud types, more than 140 if you get the cloud atlas out and look at them. I'm not even going to go into the names. Some of them are this long because they're in Latin, because as meteorologists, the only way we can look cool is to throw big words around. So most of us are pretty geeky, all right? But that's where that picture came from, and I wanted my friend David Palmer to get some credit for that. All right, there's some basic principles to remember when interpreting satellite data, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Basic principles, we're not gonna get into really detailed stuff, but when you look on the TV or the internet and start looking at satellite, I hope that you leave here with a better feeling of what you're looking at and some of the limitations and strengths of the different kinds of imagery that you'll see because they'll show them all, all the ones I'm gonna show you here. One, 
In order to get air saturated or to make clouds out of it, you have to cool the air off. The easiest way to do this is to lift it. Lifted air rises into regions of the atmosphere that are cooler, and so the capacity of the air basically to hold water decreases and it saturates, the vapor in it condenses into liquid cloud. If you keep raising it to the point it gets super saturated and it cannot hold that much water anymore, what happens? It rains or snows, depending on the temperature structure. We're not going into that. We just forecast a whole bunch of snow and it rained. <laughs> and so that temperature profile in the atmosphere is extremely important and one little mess up in there that's not identified by the models or something can really change the forecast and that's complicated. So, and to the point where I don't even want to touch it because I just look smart. Okay? So you raise, the you raise the air to make clouds, typically. Okay, this is often, most often done by lifting them. You can also form clouds by moving moisture in, but that's not as common a process. Okay, so I just want you to remember this. Clouds are often the result of lifted moist air. Got it? Okay. You got the often. What are, what are the other examples? You didn't say clouds are the result. Clouds. Often, most often the result. Good. The question is, what other ways can clouds be formed? You can actually, fog is a type of cloud, technically speaking. We'll see a picture of it here in a minute. But that's formed by cold air actually sinking into an area where there's moisture, like a river bottom. And as the cold air, which is more dense, sinks, it causes that moisture to condense and form a cloud. Okay, if it's on the ground, it's not formed by lifting, it's actually formed by sinking. Another way is to take moisture, say, from the Gulf of Mexico and just push it in horizontally across the land, which might be cooler at night because the land cools off more rapidly than the water. And as that warm, moist air moves across that cooler land, it'll turn into stratus clouds, low, low deck of clouds. The beach often has low clouds. People go to the beach to get the sun and the sand and the salt in the water and they end up with low stratus clouds. And, you know, what's going on? I paid money for this. You know, so that's the way it works very often, or sometimes, most often by lifting though. Most of the clouds you see are made of water droplets. Some clouds have been lifted so high or exist at a level so high in the atmosphere that it's cold enough for them to be ice crystals. Cirrus clouds, the, the thin wispy types, Sometimes cirrus are not so thin and wispy. Sometimes they're pretty thick. But typically those are made of ice, okay? We're going to look at some cloud top temperatures here in a few minutes and explain how that's important in forecasting some types of weather. Okay. All right. Thicker clouds that you'll see on the satellite imagery will often have very cold cloud tops because they've been lifted continuously through a farther or a deeper column of air in the atmosphere and once they've gone from relatively warm regions near the surface up through this area they become closer and closer to saturation and finally they reach saturation make a cloud and then they keep getting lifted to the point where the cloud tops are extremely cold and we'll see some examples of that that happened this week and how that affected our weather around the region here because we had pretty heavy rainfall most places. Anybody get heavy rainfall at their place? Anybody get more than two inches or so at their place that you know of? How many did you get, you know? Oh, we just flooded, that's all. Flooded. <laughs> Anybody flood bad? <laughs> there was, there was some, a lot of flooding up here. Further south you went, the more moisture there was in the atmosphere and the worse flooding they had. Some places around Chattanooga got five inches of rain in 36 hours. Which, you know, we've been in a drought for years, close to a decade with some little spurts. 2003 was a bad year up here. For, it was a record wet year, but that was, you know, in the middle of all this drought. But this week, we kind of almost turned into a normal week again, like it should be around this time of year, and everybody's kind of forgotten what it's like. So we're going to look at actual satellite footage from this week and talk a little bit about what caused some of the heavy rainfall. 